Well, hello there. This is the last mini lecture that's part of lecture four for my cognitive psychology class. And in this section, we're going to talk about some of the machines that cognitive neuroscientists use to figure out what the brain is doing. And also as part of that, to talk a little bit more about um, how localized some cognitive functions might be. Okay. One technique that cognitive neuroscientists have used is to work with patient populations looking at people who have some sort of brain damage. We've spoken about strokes before, but there are other ways that the brain can be damaged. Um, lesions can occur in which uh, the brain is damaged by a car accident or if somebody's shot in the head or uh, hit hard in the head, that causes... Um, damage to part of the brain. And then in those people who are missing functionality in one part of their brain, you can see what cognitive processes are compromised or changed as a result of that damage. So um, in this slide, I'm showing you a picture of um, uh, the brain of a man who was shot in the back in the occipital lobe. It damaged his occipital lobe. And as a result of that, uh, he had significant trouble with sight, with visual perception. So we know that the occipital lobe is involved in vision. Okay. Uh, another technique, a, a, a very commonly used technique now, is fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. And fMRI is when you see those beautiful pictures of the brain that are very colorful. That's, those are fMRI pictures typically. Uh, and what they do is they tell you what part of the brain has been active uh, in the last 10 seconds or so. Um, you can get pretty good spatial resolution with fMRI. The temporal resolution is not super. Uh, and part of that is a function of what fMRI actually measures. So we, we speak as if uh, fMRI measures the activity of neurons in the brain, and it actually doesn't do that. It's, fMRI is an indirect measure. It measures blood flow in the brain. Actually, it measures blood deoxygenation. So remember we talked about how um, energy hungry or inefficient, or hungry, your brain is. Um, it needs from the blood oxygen and glucose. So neurons that have been very active have a lot more need. And so the idea is that there would be more removal of oxygen from the blood in areas where um, there's been more neural activity. So um, what fMRI actually measures is um, uh, the presence or absence of iron molecules in the blood. So it's an indirect measure based on blood flow. The nice thing about fMRI is it doesn't, you're not required to have anything injected into you, um, which happens with other types of uh, brain um, imaging, nor does it require you to get an x-ray. So fMRI is um, nice in, in both of those ways. Um, fMRI has been used as a very effective tool to understand how the human brain identifies faces. And in the temporal lobe, there's this area called FFA, uh, where um, a lot of the processing of faces seems to occur. It's in the right temporal lobe. Um, people who have damage to their fusiform face area, FFA, have trouble recognizing other people from their faces. This is a disorder called prosopagnosia. It could come from brain damage, and we think um, maybe genetics or something that happens at birth, I'm not really sure. Um, but people who have prosopagnosia recognize others not based on their faces, but based on maybe their hairstyle, their clothing, the way they walk, their voice, something else. So um, uh, fMRI 
has been really instrumental in showing how localized the function in FFA is. It's just that you can identify this little chunk of cortex that does something super relevant for us social animals, which is to recognize one another. But uh, the first work at really localizing function came from Broca and Wernicke. We've, we've spoken about them before. I'm going to loop back around here. Um, Broca actually provided the first um, evidence of localization of function. And the way he did that actually was there was a, a man who lived in the hospital that Broca was working um, in. The man uh, um, couldn't speak. Um, but he could say the word tan, 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 tan. So they called him tan um, because that was the only sound he could make. After tan died, Broca performed an autopsy on his brain and found the area that I, you can see right there. That's an actual picture of tan's brain. You can see the area that is abnormal where there's cells missing, right? It's, it's a little pucker or missing neural tissue. And Broca concluded that since Tan could not uh, produce language, had language difficulties, that all language must be localized in that one area that we now know as Broca's area. A few years later, uh, Wernicke came along and found a different patient that had a different uh, location to their brain damage in the temporal lobe instead of in the frontal lobe. Um, and that person had uh, no trouble speaking, but had trouble understanding language. So Wernicke was able to say, mm, Broca got it wrong. All of language is not localized in Broca's area. It turns out that different aspects of language are localized in different areas of the brain, right? So Broca's area, which is up in the frontal lobe, is, the dip, is um, responsible for producing language or involved in the production of language. And Wernicke's area is involved in the comprehension of language. Um, you'll remember back, we talked about double dissociation. Um, can you find a patient that could do A but not B and another patient who can do B but not A? And we've seen that with language, right? With Broca's and Wernicke's aphasia. Um, and we've watched videos of both uh, Sarah Scott and Byron Peterson um, communicating. So we're pretty confident that Broca's area and Wernicke's area are two different areas that are involved with two different processes. Now, can we go beyond that sort of localization saying that face recognition happens here and language production happens there and language comprehension hangs, um, uh, occurs over here. Yes. The cognitive processes occur as a result of the interactions between multiple brain areas. Okay. Um, so, I don't, I'm not throwing away the concept of localization. I'm saying you can have localized areas of function and rely on interconnectivity between those areas. So for example, we now know that Broca's area and Wernicke's area work together. There are a lot of connections between the two and a few other areas, and it's the whole network together that gives rise to language. So you can refer to things both as localized, but also as distributed, right? So <clears throat> in sciences, a lot of times you'll see people arguing about theory A versus theory B, right? Is, is uh, neural activity localized or is it distributed? And people have these big fights of discourse about it. Um, and so often it turns out to be the case that both of them are right. This is one of those cases where both of them are right. There is both localization of function and distributed processing. Uh, and I just want to show you uh, <laughs> this amazing picture. There are a number of them out. People can use um, the information gathered from fMRI systems to do some special analyses on them um, called diffuser tension imagery. 
uh, uh, diffusion tensor imaging, or DTI. Um, and that, in that, those processes give rise to these gorgeous pictures where you see the pathways between different uh, areas in the brain. So this tool, DTI, is helping cognitive neuroscientists understand what different parts of the brain work together. And that is all that I'm going to tell you about cognitive neuroscience in this class. Everybody who's in my cognitive psychology class, time to head back to Canvas, complete the lab, and start studying for the quiz. Thanks. Take care.